Christmas matters, the story of Christmas, the Bethlehem scene, Christmas matters. And I just want to highlight for you, I don't think it's too soon for us to do this. It has to do with our Christmas Eve services, our Christmas Eve services. And then let me also tell you uh, just a little bit about that. Uh, you'll notice that the first one is listed as the Christmas Eve Eve service. And so uh, that's exactly right. So on the 23rd, the 23rd of December at 7.30 that Friday evening, uh, we want to invite you. We've discovered that many, many people uh, have a, a re very full schedule on Christmas Eve. And so, as a result of that, uh, they have the opportunity to come on the 23rd and celebrate a Christmas traditional service, a Christmas Eve service. It'll be a candlelight service. And I know that some of you will come to all of these services, and that's terrific. But for those of you who have schedules on the 24th, I want to invite you here on the 23rd. And so uh, we have the opportunity, and again, a great opportunity perhaps to invite your friends and your family, especially if you are tied up with uh, traditional responsibilities on the 24th. And notice, if you will, uh, the services that are happening on the 24th then on Christmas Eve. The first one is at 5.30. Uh, that's our children's service designed especially for families with children and let me just say to you uh, that is organized chaos we like it that way and uh, it is a loud service it's a lot of fun and uh, come and join us at 5 30 and then the remaining services are 7 30 again back here inside of this auditorium and then in the midst of the pandemic, we added an 11 o'clock service because you'll remember that we couldn't have more than so many people gathered together and we had to do that whole distancing thing. But we found that it really kind of fits a need and people enjoy coming at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And so that service, though, is not inside of this room. It is actually across the street in Wesley Chapel. So on the 23rd, 7.30 here, uh, on the 24th, 5.30 here, 7.30 here, 11 o'clock across the street. And so Christmas Eve services, uh, there are opportunities for you to come. And I want to say to you, to invite your family, it's a great opportunity. And then on Christmas morning, which is on Sunday, I want to just invite you, uh, listen, very casually, uh, come and join us if you will. Uh, slip in. The service will be no longer than an hour. Uh, we want to invite you at 10 o'clock on Christmas morning uh, to come in. We'll have a chance to go ahead and students uh, bring, their, uh, uh, bring their, some of their gifts and uh, we'll have a chance to uh, worship the Lord together on Christmas morning. Then notice, if you will, one service on New Year's Day. Again, it would be 10 o'clock. And so notice some of the time changes. Notice some of the times uh, for the upcoming next few weeks. And uh, in addition to being a busy time, let me just invite you. Uh, mark a couple of those on your calendar and, and join us if you will. So I want to take a minute or two, if I could, uh, today to go back and to revisit uh, the story out of Luke chapter 2. Now, before we have a chance to read together, let me just say one thing that I have discovered and I, I do know about uh, who we are as a people and who we are as a culture. We don't read much any longer. Uh, we don't typically read. Those of you who have a novel going right now or who have a book going, you know, whether it's on your Kindle or, or a hard copy, you may be uh, among the, uh, uh, the, those who uh, are kind of unusual, with a smaller percentage inside of our culture. As we've ad adapted more to a visual screen and being more visual at that point, we've stopped reading as much as we perhaps should. That really has a detrimental impact inside of our spiritual lives because we don't read the Bible much anymore. Uh, even if we have it as an app, it's convenient as a reminder, and we don't read nearly as much as we should. One thing that I'd like to just invite you to do, we have two more weeks to go uh, inside of the Christmas account. I would just like to invite you personally as a challenge uh, in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel is the story about the birth of Jesus. You can read both accounts in, I'm going to say, 15 minutes. 
maybe 20. If I read it a little bit slower, and uh, it takes me a little bit longer to work my way down through. And so I want to just invite you to read the Christmas account sometime during the Advent season. Sometime during the Advent season. Not that you need one more thing to do on your to-do list, but I think that it's important to be reminded. I think it's also significant that God gives to us every single calendar year an opportunity to be reminded about the significance of the incarnation, about God becoming flesh. And as John says in John chapter 1, Jesus became flesh and he made his home in our backyard. He's come for you and he's come for me. And so as we've had a chance to sing already today, and that uh, terrific song that Gracie led us in this morning, the manger is inseparable from the cross. Or, to use these words, the incarnation, God becoming flesh, cannot be separated from the atonement, God dying in the person of Christ for our salvation. These two are inextricably linked. Together, And Jesus himself said that he has come for that purpose. And so be reminded that in the midst of the cradle, in the midst of the manger, there is a cross. And that's the reason why you see some of the chrismons that are around our auditorium remind us of the life of Jesus about his death as well. And so I want to just invite you once again as a challenge to you and certainly to us collectively to read at some period of time the Christmas story and not just to depend upon small snippets from us to go ahead and provide that on Sunday morning. This passage comes out of Luke chapter 2 this morning and uh, you'll recognize these words. They're maybe the most familiar in all of the Christmas account. This is out of the New Living Translation and it reads this way. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding the flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the radiance, the brightness, the glory of the Lord surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them and said, Don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Let's go to the next slide. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the one that you've been waiting for all of your life, he's been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby. He's going to be wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of other angels, the armies of heaven, praising God and collectively singing, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Let's go to the next slide. When the angel had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried to the village, and they found Mary, and they found Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. What I'd like to think with you for a few minutes this morning is the phrase that was spoken by the angel to the shepherd, by the angel to the shepherd, the heavenly message, if you will, the divine message, the pronouncement of the birth of Jesus. Let's go to the next slide. And they were terrified. And that is an appropriate response whenever you see a heavenly host of angels. They were terrified, and the angel reassured them and said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all 
people. I want to think with you for just a moment, if I could, and invite you to consider with me from the Christmas story and from the characters from the Christmas story how this singular statement applies across the board and how God has demonstrated to us in a very short story and a very short account how it is that he has come into the world for all of humanity. Let's consider some of the, uh, the dramatic differences inside of the people that are intersected, their lives are impacted by the arrival of Jesus Christ on the page of history. First, let's consider this announcement to the shepherds. You know a little bit about the shepherds. They were on the social stratus. They were at the lowest rung. You know that they were not trustworthy. As a matter of fact, they were not even allowed to testify in open court because you just couldn't believe what a shepherd had to say. They were of the poorest of the poor, you would say, and so as a result of that, the announcement came to a demographic inside of society that found itself down here on the social structure. Now, it's interesting, too, that where Jesus was born, he's born in a manger, which was accessible then to all and by all in a situation for all people. If Jesus had been born in a palace, he would not have been accessible to all people. But that's not where he was born. He was born in a manger, and access, because of where he was born, is an invitation for all people. And so Jesus, this morning, finds himself coming to the poor, but also, the Bible says, to the rich. How do we know that's the case? Well, Herod, who was the elite of the elite. Some would suggest that Herod was, in fact, a god. And then also, the magi, the wise men, Likely that they were people of means, even by what they demonstrated and they brought as gifts. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Notice, if you will, the spectrum then, just economically. Jesus comes and has demonstrated that from the rich, as well as to the poor and everyone in between. I've come for all people. It's good news for everyone. The truth can be said, too, with regards to the people and how old they are. Notice, if you will, about the age of a guy whose name was Zechariah. If, again, if you don't know that story, it's Zechariah and Elizabeth, the mom and the dad of John the Baptist. Notice, if you will, also a gentleman named Simeon who made this statement. I can die now because I have seen the one I've been waiting for, Jesus. Simeon makes that statement when Mary and Joseph take Jesus to be circumcised to the temple. And then also an elderly woman whose name is Anna. She's a prophetess. And as a result of that, the elder individuals are represented inside of the Christmas story. The youngest of the young, we find... <clears throat> already read this morning about how even in utero, John the Baptist recognizes Jesus and the divine. And then Mary, her age, she's just an adolescent. I have great joy. I have good news. It's for all people, for all ages. Clearly, then, we don't need to spend much time in recognizing that the mother of Jesus, as well as the people surrounding Jesus, Elizabeth and previously mentioned Anna, and then the men inside of the story, the men inside of the story, Joseph, we find the shepherds, we find the wise men. I have come for all people. I have good news. It's great joy for all people. Notice, too, that he's come for those people who are religious. And then 
for some of you who may find yourself in this category, the non-religious. He's come for both ends of the spectrum. The religious, Simeon, as well as Anna, and also Zechariah. They were in the temple, and they were people that certainly who had an understanding about spiritual things. And then also those who were not religious. And across the spectrum at that point. Shepherds, not typically people you thought of to spend a lot of time inside the temple. And even the occupation of Joseph being a carpenter. And all of that represented in the life, in the story of the arrival of Jesus Christ. I've got good news. It's going to be great joy for all people. People who are poorer. People who are richer. Older. Younger. Women. Men. Religious. Non-religious. People who were educated. The wise men fall under that category. Or the magi. The non-educated. The shepherds. Those who were Jewish, most of the characters inside of the Christmas story, except the Magi, they were Gentiles. I have good news. I've got good news of great joy for all people. Don't be afraid. Well, why is that significant this morning? And why is that announcement so, so important? I want to invite you to just consider that one sentence and tie it together with another sentence that Paul uses inside of the book of Romans. And he says this. All people, all people, in every age and in every station, all people have sinned and they have fallen short of God's target, His glory, His expectation. You see, the problem is so universal that the solution also has to be the possibility of impacting all people. I have a problem. You have a problem. We have a problem. Our sin separates us from God. There needs to be a remedy. There needs to be a solution. How can we, as people who've been separated from God by our actions, by our thoughts, by our behavior, how can we find our way back into a relationship with a holy God. It's interesting then that when we consider the people whose lives were impacted by the Christmas story, all of us have sinned, says the Bible. Let's go to the next slide and just be reminded. Those who are poor, those who are rich. Those who are old, those who are young. Those who are women, those who are men. And any category that you want to go ahead and use to somehow isolate or identify people, these categories, all of us, says the Bible, have been impacted by sin. We need a Savior. We need a Savior. The Bible reminds us then, not only that we need a Savior, but has a remedy. I want to just invite you to think with me that In the Christmas story, we have the invitation to respond to the remedy of the one for for us as we've been separated from sin. The verse is this, don't be afraid, says the angel. Now listen, I think that this is a gospel-centered verse in the fact that If I know that my life is apart from Jesus Christ and I am headed towards hell, I certainly would be terrified. Don't be terrified. 
Don't be afraid. Why? Because I have good news. Great joy. It's for all people. For all people. So let me just remind you of a couple of uh, understandings, a couple of verses, a couple of uh, very quick snapshots about the whole idea about for all people. Think with me about these verses, if you will. Let's go to the next slide. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. To save the world through him. I've got good news. It's going to bring great joy. It's for all people. It's for whosoever. Whosoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's only one and only Son. Notice, if you will, that there is some human interaction, some responsibility where and how we deal with the one who is the solution to our problem. Paul says in the book of Romans that he wants to go ahead and be reminded about how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him and, and how can they believe unless they've never heard about him and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved now I don't know how this happens inside of of my life but God seems to resurrect some things that have happened in many 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 years ago uh, and remind me and as I was thinking about this earlier in the week again as oftentimes this happens that there is a course again that I learned in Bible school it's around the same time that I learned about heaven and again, it was a one-week Bible school, and uh, I can't, I, I don't know how God continues to use these lines that remind me of biblical truth. That, it's a course that's, uh, it's an old one. It's not a, I can tell you it's old, because let's go to the next slide, because uh, this is a, uh, it, it has one of those words, meaneth. Now, I don't, people don't talk using King James like that anymore, and we oftentimes don't sing like that anymore. And uh, let me just ask you, here's the course. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. Do any of you have ever heard that? I even asked a Baptist earlier and he said he never heard of it. Raise your hands high. Never. With me, here we go. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. One more time. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. The reason I remember that is because they used to break the, the room up into four sections. Whosoever surely meaneth me, oh surely me. Whosoever, like hallelujah, hallelujah, praise you the Lord, right? Whosoever surely meaneth me, you know, and I, I like shouting that at five. Whosoever. Do you know how astonished I was that later on in life when I was sitting at Delanco camp and I began to understand that whosoever means me? That Jesus didn't come for a whosoever. He came for me. 
that the, the birth of Jesus Christ is not about a whosoever, it's about you. Whosoever means me. When Jesus comes to the world and the announcement of the angel, I have good news. It's going to bring great joy for you, for me, for us. All means me. All means me. If I'm a person who is apart from God because of my sin, He has come for me. He has come for you. I have good news for you today. Whosoever means you, means me. Let's review the verses again, shall we? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that if I believe in Him, I don't have to worry about perishing eternally, but I can live with Him now and forever. That if I call upon Him by faith, He'll make a difference in my life today. This is the message of Christmas this morning. This is the message of God becoming flesh. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, said the angel. I have good news for you. Let's go to the next slide. Read it with me, if you will. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to me, to you. This morning, as we move closer and can't seem to pump the brakes hard enough to keep Christmas from coming so quickly, I just want to say to you, do not miss the message of great joy. Because the one who has come for all people has come because all have sinned. He's the solution, the remedy. He's the answer. Jesus Christ in the flesh. Bethlehem's baby. To being separated from a holy God. Will you bow with me? This morning, Lord, it is much easier for us to consider and think about the Bible in words of whosoever. But will you help many people this morning to consider that whosoever means me, means us. Whosoever is our name placed inside of that verse. Whosoever is a response that you invite us to make personally to the arrival of Jesus Christ on the page of history. Help us as we continue to consider and think more about the reality of the birth of Jesus, that it's not just a story for someone else, or it's not just a story for others. But Lord, even this morning, we pray, you'll move inside of our hearts. Lord, in the midst of our adoration as we come and adore you, in the midst of uh, our words of we'll praise your name forever, we are grateful for the words of good news that bring great joy for us. And we give you thanks. 
And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, to whom honor, power, majesty, and dominion belong now and forevermore. Amen. God bless. What are the things that matter for you surrounding the celebration of the birth of of Jesus Christ? How are your priorities unfolding even this Christmas?